Hello, welcome to Book Breakdowns. Today's book is The Measure of Reality, Quantification in Western Europe, 1250 to 1600. We are so familiar with the concept of measurement that we take it for granted. For example, when we want to change furniture, we have to measure the size. At the end of the month, we check the progress of our KPIs. Even setting the alarm clock and choosing clothes according to the temperature, all our actions are related to the quantification of reality. Have you ever wondered, compared to the discrete objects that actually exist, how would we describe things like centimeters, degrees Celsius, or stock market points without using specific numbers and scales? When did our world start to be defined by measurement? Why are we so obsessed with measurement? I will not answer this question for now, but introduce the author of this book, Alfred W. Crosby. You may have heard of his other two works, The Columbian Exchange, Biological and Cultural Consequences of 1492 and Ecological Imperialism, The Biological Expansion of Europe, 9001900. These two books laid the foundation for ecological history and inspired later works such as Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond. Crosby describes in these two books a series of biological exchanges that took place between the old and new worlds after Columbus, such as corn, chili peppers and potatoes entering Europe, and sugarcane and coffee entering America, changing the ecology and culture of the world. But at the same time, Europeans brought smallpox, which destroyed native cultures, and brought back syphilis, which is still hard to get rid of, when writing these two books, Alfred W. Crosby came up with a question. How did Europeans cross the Atlantic with their superior navigation skills, hit wherever they pointed with their precise ballistic calculations, and use joint stock companies to carry out colonial expansion? It seemed that Europeans were always one step ahead more efficiently organizing human resources and using material tools. How did they do it? Traditionally, textbooks give a simple explanation, science and technology. Do you notice that this seems like a circular argument? That is to say, technological development made Europe at the forefront of technology, and technological advancement showed that Europe's technology developed rapidly. What was the driving force behind technological development? Or in the author's words, what lit that match? This book gives his answer. Alfred W. Crosby says that the measurement mania of industrial civilization originated in the West between 1,250 and 1,600, that is, in the late Middle Ages and Renaissance. During this period, Western society underwent a series of changes, gradually shifting from mystical qualitative thinking to precise quantitative thinking. It was this key mental shift that laid the foundation for the future scientific revolution and industrial revolution. He called it a mental revolution. Next, I will divide this book into two parts. The first part will talk about Europe's original qualitative thinking, what kind of cognitive system it was before 1250. In other words, if we want to understand how the match of mental revolution was lit, we have to first understand what material was on the matchstick. The second part will talk about striking the match, which is what the author calls the visualization of quantitative thinking, as well as other accelerants which are a series of technological innovations that made measurement possible. To understand this mental revolution, we have to first talk about the old mentality that was overthrown. When we say that Europe gradually moved towards quantitative thinking, we do not mean that before that, Europeans did not know what quantification was or did not care about numbers. On the contrary, as early as ancient Greece, Pythagoras, Plato, and Aristotle regarded mathematics as the truth of the cosmic order. For example, Plato thought that the ideal number of citizens in his republic should be 5,040, and he had a whole and a zero. How did he come up with that? There might be two reasons. One is that his student Aristotle also said that the maximum number of people who can hear one person's voice without amplification is about 5,000, 
but he and Plato did not seem to provide any evidence to prove that this number is 5,040. Another reason is more mysterious because it is the factorial of seven, which is the product of multiplying from one to seven, and it can also be divided by numbers from one to ten. Anyway, there are a lot of numbers that can divide 5,040. So it is very convenient for grouping. Why did Plato love to play with numbers? Because he believed that the real world was a shadow of the ideal world, and what we thought of as reality was just a sensation produced by our sensory system. So it was unreliable and changeable. Instead, abstract concepts were eternal, and mathematics was the purest abstract concept in the world. Shapes like squares, circles. And triangles were pure ideas that were stable and precise. Plato's student Aristotle also thought so, but he thought mathematics was unrealistic. He said mathematicians had to abandon perceptible and opposing qualities such as weight, temperature, hardness, etc., in order to measure the dimensions of the world. Don't you find it strange that these things are clearly measurable? But the Europeans at that time did not think so. Compared to discrete objects in reality, which are clear and distinct objects, things like temperature and hardness seemed more like a continuous state to them rather than a quantity. These were things that could be sensed by reality, so they were very low level. We are now used to dividing reality into some kind of uniform units, but this kind of thinking was actually very unfamiliar at that time. This was a side effect of mystical mathematics. The practical techniques used to measure reality were considered to have little to do with mathematics. For example, architectural engineering, observation and calendar making, as well as various market activities such as weighing and measuring length, etc., actually applied mathematics. But for a long time, they were not combined with the noble mathematical philosophy. So by the Middle Ages. Europe's mathematical concepts and measurements had become very far apart. Although the philosophy of ancient Greece and Rome had declined, their mathematical concepts were still inherited. Measurement was basically regarded as a craft technique rather than a mathematical application, and mathematics became a footnote to theological cosmology. Let's talk about measurement first. You will find that the units of measurement at that time were not created based on mathematical understanding at all. So many ancient units sound very specific to the point of being weird. For example, the British unit of length foot is the length of a foot. But when measuring land, they have to use another unit called furlong, which means the distance a team of oxen can plow without resting. And then there were the medieval builders who constructed complex structures for Gothic cathedrals. They were very familiar with geometric methods, but they only knew how to apply them without thinking about building deeper theories. At most, they would point to a piece of stone or wood and say, "Cut it like this." But if you ask them what kind of solid geometry principle was in this cutting method, they would be confused. Let's look at mathematics next. Around the fifth century, ad. There was a theologian named Stt. Augustine, whose theological theory was considered one of the signs of the beginning of the Middle Ages and one of the sources of early Catholic doctrine. He said, "We cannot despise the science of numbers, but how did he do math? He believed that God created the world in six days because six is a perfect number. It is the sum of its three factors: one." Two and three. The seventh day rested because seven is also sacred. It is the sum of the first odd number three and the first non-prime even number four. Later in the 13th century, this concept was still popular. There was a scholar named Stt. Thomas Aquinas who believed that Revelation said only 144,000 people could be saved on Judgment Day because this number was sacred. 144 is Jesus' 12 disciples multiplied by 12 tribes of Israel. 1,000 is 10 cubed. 3 is the number of days between Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Their product is very sacred. You will find that those theologians have a lot of Plato's style. They think that mathematics is a way of knowing abstract qualities, 
and they are indifferent to the reality of sensory perception, although they already had the concept of number theory, which studies the relationship between numbers and numbers. Their focus was on the essence of each number being related to God. What kind of relationship was more sacred and beautiful, rather than the relationship between these numbers as abstract concepts? This old mentality of medieval Europe was to mystify mathematics on the one hand and vulgarize measurement on the other, resulting in a lack of understanding between the two. In this old mentality, reality as God's creation should not be measured by human standards. The differences between things are differences in nature. The cognition of things should be understood from their fundamental nature. This old mentality produced what the author calls the ancient sacred model, in which time and space are human scales determined by symbolic meanings rather than absolute, uniform, and quantifiable concepts. The author reminds us that the common sense of each era is different. Our common sense was unimaginable a thousand years ago. Maybe you don't understand this very well, so let me give you some examples. For example, time. We now know that a day is 24 hours, and each hour is the same as every other hour. But medieval Europeans only learned the concept of time from the Bible, which was based on the Middle Eastern people's view of time. They knew that there should be 12 hours in both day and night. The problem is that for Europe, which is a high latitude region, most of the year there is no equal day and night. How can they make sure that there are 12 hours in both day and night? Europeans came up with an accordion-like system of hours to ensure that each season had 12 hours of day and night, but not the kind of time unit we understand as hours. How do they tell what time it is? They don't look at their watches or the position of the sun in the sky. But listen to the church bells reminding them to pray. According to the mainstream division, they prayed seven times a day and rang the bell seven times, so people had no concept of what time it was, but only knew which two bell rings it was between. As for when they rang the bell, it was not very clear. During the Catholic fasting period, they could only eat after the ninth hour of prayer. This ninth hour means the ninth hour after sunrise. If we calculate that sunrise time is at six o'clock in the morning, then the ninth hour should actually correspond to three o'clock in the afternoon. But in order to shorten the time of hunger during the summer days, the monks began to ring the bell earlier. Gradually, the hour that was originally in the afternoon became noon. The word nones that meant the ninth hour became noon in English. As for other hours, they just squeezed forward or backward a bit. It was purely an operational issue. The essence of this concept of time was to lean reality towards symbolism and meet the needs of theological systems. The concept of space was similar. The popular geocentric theory and flat Earth theory at that time were not only based on observation, but more importantly. They conformed to theological order. Geocentric theory believed that our ground was the center of the universe, and the heavens were like a half fish bowl inverted on top of the earth, revolving around us. The celestial bodies on the outermost sphere were doing perfect circular motion because circle was a concept with perfect quality. The ground we live on is the lowest level area. So its principle of motion is not perfect circles, but low-level straight lines. The Earth was like a big cake divided by God into several regions corresponding to different living creatures. When drawing maps at that time, medieval maps did not follow north-south orientation, but put east at the top of the map. Why? Because Eden was said to be in the east. Of course. Maps at that time were not based on geometric projection, but were expressionist landscape paintings with many monsters and saints on them, full of symbolic meanings. Things like scale and legend were not considered at all. As for mathematical concepts, for a long time, Europeans did not care about precise numbers. They were satisfied with words like a little or a few months. Just let me tell you about the Roman numerals that were popular at that time, and you will know how unfavorable they were for mathematical development. Many watches still have letters like I, V, and X on them. These are Roman numerals. Actually, Roman numerals also have L, 
C, D and M, which are 50, 100, 500 and 1000 respectively. Putting letters representing smaller numbers in front of larger numbers means subtracting them from larger numbers. Putting them behind means adding them. For example, VI is 6 and 4 is 4. What if I want to represent a number like 1549? Write it as Mkx Vixavigi. This last J means the end of the number. As you can imagine, these Roman numerals are definitely not suitable for calculation. Therefore, at that time, calculation was done by finger counting and counting boards. Finger counting is to use the bending and various shapes of fingers to represent different numbers. For larger numbers, you have to use your arms, elbows, and even belly buttons. For example, pointing your thumb at your belly button means 50,000. For more complex calculations, you usually have to use counting boards. Counting boards are similar to our abacus. They also use beads to complete calculations. But what is shocking is that before the 10th century ad, when European priests reintroduce Arabic numerals and counting boards from the Islamic region in southern Spain, Europe had been without counting boards for five centuries. Well, let's summarize the qualitative thinking mentality of medieval Europe. In this old mentality, numbers have moral and emotional values. They are not pure quantitative units, but have qualitative symbolic meanings. In the old European model of thought, everything in the world has different natures given by God and is full of symbolic meanings. It is a great sin to try to measure everything with human rational standards, let alone that measurement is not convenient. So why did Europe later abandon the ancient sacred model? Next we will talk about how the match of mental revolution was ignited. First let us talk about the strike of the match, visualization, how it made everything can be measured, a popular way of thinking. Visualization means using charts, tables, etc., that can be seen by the eyes to convey information faster and more directly, for example, the use of words and language. In the past, Europeans used to read aloud, and it was not until the 15th century that library rules required silence. The popularization of paper, pen, and ink and the increase in literacy rate made European elites no longer acquire knowledge from oral gospels and epics but turned to written records. Silent reading became the mainstream way of acquiring knowledge, even for our audiobook products. We also have ways such as mind maps and manuscripts to facilitate your eyes to quickly receive information. In addition to this, there are two main aspects of expression, art and commerce. In terms of art, we should be familiar with perspective in painting. But I will first talk about a less obvious form of visualized art, music. Isn't music for listening? You will understand as soon as I say it, musical notation. In the 7th century in Europe, although there were many religious chants, theologians at that time worried that music would disappear because sound could not be recorded and could only be remembered by singers' brains. Chanting was the singing version of Catholic prayer texts. Early notation did not specify exact pitches, but used shapes to record when the melody rose or fell. By the 11th century, an Italian named Guido began to popularize the use of musical notation, using different equidistant lines to mark the exact changes in pitch. Guido named different pitches after the first few words of popular chants. You listen and see if you are familiar. Ut, re, mi, fa. Saul Law. Yes, this is the prototype of the modern common scale. After Guido, musicians began to boldly try to mix popular music and religious music, adding more parts to chants and creating polyphonic music. In order to record complex part coordination, musicians in the 13th century invented rhythmic notation. Rhythm divided time into uniform units. Eyes reading notes knew how long each note lasted. Since then, 
Even deaf Beethoven could write complex symphonies. The church believed that music, as a form of conveying God's divinity, had become a tool for demonstrating human rational ability. People were busy praising composers for being awesome and forgot to worship God. In 1322, the church ordered that corrupted polyphonic music should not be used. But secular courts and streets were already full of new music created with new notation methods. Musical notation may not only be the first widely used standard chart in Europe; it also showed people human rationality's ability to manipulate time. And space was, of course, represented by painting. Medieval paintings often painted things from different times together, and there was no perspective. They arranged positions and sizes according to the meaning of characters. Painting did not reflect space; it only had pure symbolism. With the development of optics and geometry, artists realized that they had methods to represent space. This was perspective. Although the subject matter was still religious, perspective turned painting into an imitation of real space. Giotto, a great painter of the 13th century, was good at painting huge murals, using perspective to make viewers feel physical depth in front of paintings. In order to make their paintings more proportional to real vision, painters calculated precisely how big people or objects should be drawn in which area, indicating which distance. Painters gradually became mathematicians and masters of geometry. Whether it is painting or music, both increase greatly between 1,250 and 1,600 A.D. The reason is well known to everyone. That is the development of capitalism. A large number of new bourgeoisie emerged. These bourgeoisie spent money on art products of mental revolution. Then how did they make money, and what did it have to do with mental revolution? This has to do with bookkeepers who kept accounts. A highly monetized economy made it easy to record commodity prices, but currency prices fluctuated constantly. And credit methods such as bills of exchange and futures disrupted the order of delivery and payment for long-distance trade, making accounting very troublesome for merchants. In the past, accounting had to tell a story about the whole process of a commodity and even write about chatting with old Wang next door in between. However, a new accounting method appeared. Economic behaviors at different times could be presented on one chart. Double-entry bookkeeping. Each transaction would be listed under asset and liability columns on two opposite pages, keeping both sides equal. Venice was Europe's busiest port. Merchants there used double-entry bookkeeping extensively, so much so that Venetian method became synonymous with double-entry bookkeeping. It was no coincidence that the city also began to have public lectures on algebra. Pacioli, who was later hailed as the father of accounting, studied mathematics in Venice. He used mathematics to perfect the double-entry bookkeeping method invented by others. Pacioli was a monk, but he was also a mathematician. Leonardo da Vinci's friend. He wrote a book called Summa di Arithmetica, which said that architecture, astrology, military, theology, etc., were essentially all mathematics. Of course, there were also perspective and music. The most practical part of this book was that it explained clearly how to operate double-entry bookkeeping. He suggested counting property status on one day. Then keeping three accounts according to memorandum, journal, and ledger categories, and marking them with holy cross to ward off demons. Such an account book seemed to take a picture of a long storm, clearly showing the position and direction of every drop of rain in the storm, the positive and negative quantities, and the out and in of things at different times could all be balanced in the end. The bourgeoisie learned a very important thing from double-entry bookkeeping: everything can be measured, and everything needs to be measured. From the three examples of musical notation, perspective, and double-entry bookkeeping, we can feel that these visualization methods gradually dominated people's senses. Mathematics invaded reality and became the only method to understand and control reality. That is to say. 
Through mathematical measurement methods, the sacred meaning of reality gradually faded away, and the clear visualization methods made quantification the most popular solution for manipulating reality. The old model of European ideas began to accelerate its transition from around 1250 AD. Quantitative thinking gradually gained the upper hand. There were many catalysts for igniting this match, such as the fact that power in medieval Europe was not centralized. Relatively independent cities and small countries provided shelter for various ideas, and there were many places where the earliest universities appeared. Concentrating scholars to specialize in research, they needed to sort out a large number of scriptures and had to use more rigorous methods to arrange documents. For this, they invented catalog systems, chapter titles, header titles, etc. Making texts well organized and easy to retrieve, many scholastic philosophers found that poetic and symbolic language could not meet their needs. They had to use rigorous logical language to sort out their thoughts, so they began to use mathematics to describe God's creation. Quantitative thinking was about to sprout from it. More importantly, commerce and trade were becoming more and more developed at that time. Europe was entering the era of monetary economy, but faced with the problem of shortage of precious metal hard currency, these problems also became part of theologians' research. A monk named Oresme discovered in the 14th century that if he lowered the gold content of coins, there would be more coins, so the value of coins would depreciate. People would become poorer instead. Which is the principle of inflation, and bad money drives out good money. Merchants began to use the concept of accounting currency, fixed and ideal measurement scale, and facilitated determining exchange ratios between different currencies. Through currency, every commodity began to have a price, and price came from measurement. Even time began to have a price, which is interest. Under the impact of visualization and new technology. Cracks appeared in the old model. If even time can be measured by numbers, what else can't? But to truly ignite mental revolution, it needed catalysts from time, space, and mathematics aspects to give people tools to measure everything. Let's start with time. Europeans in this period improved the Julian calendar inherited from ancient Rome, calibrated human time according to astronomical time. And created the Gregorian calendar that we now use universally. The reason for this reform was actually not for astronomy, but for Easter. The Church stipulated that Easter was the first Sunday after the first full moon after the equinox. But because the Julian calendar had a deviation in estimating the solar year, there were too many leap years, and by 1582 A.D., the Julian calendar was 11 days behind the actual time. The church was very annoyed. If they followed the doctrine, they would not be able to celebrate Easter after the real equinox that year. Pope Gregory XII made a decision that went against his ancestors. He adopted a new calibrated calendar and jumped forward 11 days directly, which is the common era calendar we use now. Many believers found it difficult to accept this reform. The standard of time was actually set according to celestial bodies rather than theology. However, the more core change was the hour. We just said that medieval Europeans used bells to mark time, similar to China, except that Europe's bells were controlled by churches. Hours were unequal, and a day was divided into several segments according to prayer time. There was no bell ringing at night. But astrologers needed to record changes in planetary positions. Monks had to prepare for night prayers. What to do? And if it was cloudy and they could not see the position of the sun and moon, they would have difficulty knowing the time. People needed a kind of clock that could accurately tell people at any time that the sacred moment had arrived and it was time to pray. Since ancient Greek and Roman timing tools had been lost. Medieval Europeans mostly used candles, horn glasses, and water clocks, but they were not accurate enough for monks. Around the 13th century, a monastery in Europe invented a wonderful solution: mechanical clock. 
The core device of a mechanical clock is called an escapement. It can make mechanical devices move at a fixed rhythm, such as a pendulum clock, which is driven by a pendulum's fixed swing to drive an anchor. Swinging left and right will control the gear's release and hold, making a tick sound. The earliest mechanical clocks mostly used gravity to drive, using escapements to control the descent of weights. So they were built on high towers, which also made it easier for the whole city to hear the bells. By 1335 A.D., there was already a mechanical clock that could report time 24 hours a day in a chapel in Milan, Italy. It rang as many times as the hour. Scholars at that time praised this clock for knowing what time it is at different times and what specific points it means, which is most necessary for all life and work. Mechanical clocks also provided a new way of understanding the world. For example, Oresme, who discovered inflation, praised God for creating the world like making clocks, letting clocks run and sustain themselves. Not only that, as more and more cities erected clock towers with mechanical devices, citizens organized their lives according to new bells. Escapements, tick sound, and music speed together made the concept of uniform and divisible world popular. Petrarch, the father of humanism, said, "Life moves forward steadily without looking back or stopping in between. We move forward bravely regardless of storms. Whether this road is easy or hard, short or long, there is one constant speed throughout. Time was thus tamed by rationality." And spatial innovation was slower. There were mainly two major theories: latitude and longitude, and geometrism. Previous European maps were generally so called to maps. That is, there was a T-shaped body of water in the center of the map. Asia was above it. Jerusalem was at the T intersection point. Europe was in the lower left corner. Africa was in the lower right corner. Showing theological worldview with compasses from the east, determining direction became easier for navigation. Therefore, around the end of the 13th century, sailors began to use a kind of portolan chart that could show land direction. This kind of map mainly recorded coastline contours and ports, and used radial lines to mark directions with a certain scale to reflect distance. Portolan charts were generally limited to Mediterranean Sea and surrounding narrow waters. So even if mapmakers did not know that Earth was curved, geometric deviation was not too big. But it would be inaccurate if it involved ocean navigation. Around 1400 A.D., Ptolemy's geography from Eastern Roman Empire was translated into Latin again. Earth roundness and grid map concepts enlightened sailors. They found theoretical basis for theoretical and practical deviation. Mapmakers could then determine coordinates according to celestial positions. From then on, use uniform grids to cover Earth's surface to mark coordinates, which are latitude and longitude we use now. And they also knew that they needed to apply geometry to correct the deviation of Earth's curved surface projected onto map plane. This was similar to the principle of perspective for painters. When Spain and Portugal began colonial competition in the late 15th century, the Pope proposed that the boundary for dividing Earth between the two countries should be three seven o leagues west of Cape Verde Islands, calculated by degrees. It can be seen that using latitude and longitude to divide space had been widely accepted by then. At the same time, the development of navigation industry inspired astronomical observation. The clever Oresme asked, "It was difficult for people on a ship to judge whether another ship was moving. How could we be sure that Earth was stationary and Sun was moving?" But when he raised this question in the mid 14th century, he did not have enough mathematical knowledge. Two hundred years later, Copernicus used precise mathematical proof for heliocentrism, kicked Earth away from the center of the universe, published on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres in 1543. Add this book not only discussed heliocentrism. 
but was also the first work in Europe to use mathematics to describe astronomy in a thousand years. He calculated how far stars had to be to look still when Earth moved, which actually proposed a new and vast cosmology. Bruno was born later in 1600 A.D. Not only because he supported Copernicus, but also because he proposed that there was infinite void outside Earth, which was uniform space. We have already said that mathematics helped Europeans understand absolute time and space. Let's talk about what mathematical progress enabled Copernicus to write on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres and made double-entry bookkeeping easy to read. We have to talk about Oresme again. He proposed in the 14th century that to measure things with continuous quantities, we had to assume there were invisible points, lines, and planes to facilitate mathematization. But as we said. It was really too difficult to do calculations with fingers and counting boards, let alone using Roman numerals to record. Fortunately, people from the East came to save the day again. In the 12th century, a great Arab mathematician named Al Khwarizmi's work was translated into Latin. Indian Arabic numerals entered Europe. The new numbers were simple and clear. No matter how big a number was. It could be expressed with ten symbols, perfectly adapted to decimal system. But Europeans still took some time to adapt because they did not have the concept of zero before. Europeans thought that zero was only used as a symbol for carrying and not a number. They also mixed Roman numerals, such as MCCCC94, meaning 1,494. New arithmetic symbols emerged as needed. Such as plus and minus signs with a cross and a horizontal line appearing in 1489 A.D. Before that, people could only use words or letters to describe operations. There were also methods such as using letters to represent unknowns, decimal notation, etc. In short. Mathematics gradually separated from language and gradually became symbolic. One was one, transcending nature, existing steadily. By the end of the 16th century, Kepler, who proposed the three laws of planetary motion, believed that God created the universe according to mathematics. Humans and God used the same rationality to understand mathematics. He wrote, besides numbers and sizes. What else can human minds understand? To sum up, in Europe from 1250 to 1600 A.D., clocks and calendars divided time into uniform and calculable precise lines. Latitude and longitude and heliocentrism turned space into uniform and calculable geometric shapes. New time-space view corresponded to new music and painting. And Arabic numerals promoted mathematical symbolization, greatly simplified mathematics, and facilitated accounting. Human rational thinking was ready to measure everything. By this point, we have roughly understood the mental revolution of Europeans between 1250 and 1600 A.D. We all know a saying: "Time is money." This sentence was actually said by Benjamin Franklin. A founding father and great scientist of America in 1748 A.D. We just said that money has uniform units, while time used to be like an accordion. Making an equation between these two is the effect of mental revolution. Reality can be divided into uniform units, then visualized as an image measured by mathematical methods. The universe is no longer complex and meaningful or high above. Practicality overwhelmed sacredness. More and more bourgeoisie gained secular power from it. As Gutenberg's printing became more and more popular, people could read how artillery shooting targets, navigation paths of distant continents, human muscle composition, etc., were visualized precisely by mathematical methods. As Galileo said. The universe is written in the language of mathematics. This language's characters are various triangles, circles, and other geometric shapes. Without these shapes, humans cannot read a word of this great book of the universe. Without these shapes, people can only wander in a dark maze. The mentality that Europeans established in this stage uniquely combined mathematics and measurement. 
greatly enhancing their ability to control and organize reality. And these developments laid the foundation for the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution. This thinking inertia also spread to everyone living in modern society. Next time you listen to music or fill in Excel, you can think that you are still illuminated by the match that was lit more than 700 years ago. Well, that's all I have to introduce to you. You can click the share button to share this book with your friends for free. See you next time.